My name is Monk Grove for the Phileas Jazz Archive at Hamilton College. Very pleased to have John LaBarbera with me today. I'm going to introduce you as a um, first or fourth trumpeter, <laughs> <laughs> composer, arranger, and I'm very glad to have you here because I love talking about composing and arranging. Well, thanks, Monk. Uh, I've watched your interviews with a number of folks, including my brother, Pat, and I, you know, I really enjoy being a part of this, really. Excellent. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I had a couple uh, thoughts of, and questions about the the family band. Uh, for those of you who might be watching, we had three brothers, and your father and mother were also in the group. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And what? How old were you during the years that this band was active? I think I started when I was six or seven. If if Pat was eight, then I was six. And and Joe would have been. Oh wait, no. I think I was seven and Joe was five or four. I'm sorry, Joe was four or five. So somewhere along the nut in that line. Uh, it's hard to remember because we were always playing. The family band came much, not much later, but my mother at first was not part of the band, as you probably know from Pat. But uh, I think when I was about eight, we were gigging steadily with as a family band. Did, did your father write parts for your trumpet playing that with, <laughs> with the fact that you were seven or eight? No, no, he, he, we just played stock arrangements. We didn't, we didn't ease into it. I mean, uh, they weren't that difficult. The stocks weren't that difficult, but we, we started right out playing stocks. He did, he wrote some polka things out that, that um, he would transcribe some polkas uh, parts for the trumpet that were originally for maybe, maybe uh, clarinet or mandolin. Pat would play clarinet and I would play, well, during those parts, when we played the polkas, I played piano most of the time. But he would he would copy some parts, you know, for for trumpet, but not a lot. For the folks who don't know, can you explain what stocks means? Oh um, well, these were dance band arrangements. They were called convertible arrangements. Uh, I called them contemptible, contemptible. And uh, uh, anyway, these arrangements were written for a typical society dance band, which included violin, piano, bass, and drums, um, uh, saxophones. So you would have your first alto, your second tenor, and the third part would be baritones sometimes, right? And two trumpets and one trombone, usually. And they were expandable, also expendable. Uh, so you could play them with a trumpet and an alto saxophone, first trumpet, first alto, and rhythm section, and they would sound. But then you could add all those other instruments and they'd sound fuller. And this is the type of arranging that we used to use for the Catskill Mountains uh, singers. You know, they, they want to play it with a trio and a full big band, it's got to be expandable. And it's, it's a certain technique that was uh, Spud Murphy, Johnny Warrington, uh, all those guys could write these things, Van Alexander, uh, and they were quite popular. And my father, we would go every week to Rochester, New York, to Levis Music, and he would buy more stocks, whatever the popular tune was, and we'd play it. I've got them all in my garage. No kidding. Oh, yeah. Hundreds. Well, so Hundreds I'm of... in the future, you can have a, another band playing the stocks. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing those names you mentioned in uh, how, junior high uh, we called it the stage band. Yeah, you had to call it the stage band. Yeah. Now there is a certain skill, I guess, a uh, formulatic skill to to writing in that in that fashion. I'm I'm wondering. I, I looked up just before we we joined today. Some of the top popular songs in 1957. So, would you get requests, people coming up to the band, and say, "Hey"? Can you play Raunchy or can you play Sleepwalk or how about some Elvis Presley? We would get that occasionally, but, but it was rare. It was rare for the clientele that we were playing for. Um, I think we had a couple of rock and roll things that were, you know, popular. The Also the Hucklebuck, you know, popular dance kind of things. 
but nothing really current for that that period. Uh, I mean, you have to remember that also in that period, people were singing Oh My Papa and uh, things like that were in parallel universe with the Elvis Presleys and the others. That's a terrific way to say that. And I've, I've been fascinated by that because when you look at the top 10 from a particular month and week in the mid 50s, you, you see exactly that. Mitch Miller followed by Elvis or the other way around. It, it's really fascinating. Yeah, and, and you remember the hit parade, of course, that would give you the top 10 or top 15. Well, Pop also, also bought these books. They were combo books called Combo Orcs. Combo Orcs. And, yeah, and, and they would have like the hit tunes and it was a cheap and dirty way of, you know, playing with a small band and, and covering those. So we would have a whole pile of music with us. And if someone had a request and we had it, bam, it'd come out and we'd play it. It was good training. Let's suppose you had a week in the summer and you played three gigs. What kind of uh, money would you expect from your father individually? Originally, I think we got three dollars, then it went up to five dollars. You know, we were buying our own comic books when we were in school and, and we had more money than anybody in, in my class. Because you remember five bucks back in, in the 50s was a considerable allowance when most, most kids were getting 25 cents or 50 cents as an allowance if they got an allowance. Do you remember if at some point you, you mentioned the stock arrangements and you're, you're playing all this different music. Did you have like this epiphany or aha moment? Like I could do this. I could arrange. I, I want to do that. Well, I don't know. If it, if it really was an epiphany moment, but I remember when we started getting interested in jazz, real jazz, not the Dixieland or the swing stuff that we were playing as kids. When we got into high school and we were all of a sudden heard Miles Davis and we heard all of these great artists, I was the one who took them off the records. I have, for some reason, I have the ability to hear all those inner lines and then write them down. I was the one who did that. So we could copy uh, So What, you know, the Miles Davis group with the three horns or two horns, and, and I would copy all the, the notes off and, and write them out. So I was in the habit of doing that, but it really, um, we didn't listen to big bands at all, and not at all, but I mean, we listened to some Glenn Miller and stuff like that, Stan Kenton, but I really didn't get into uh, big bands until I got into college when I heard, you know, toward the end of my senior year, I started hearing Woody Herman 63 and we saw Woody Herman's band live and Maynard 61 and all those bands. And it really had a big effect on me for some reason, it just grabbed me. And, and maybe because I had the ability to hear some of that inner stuff, then I gravitated toward that kind of writing. Although originally it was all small bands for us. Was your father, um, I'm not sure how to put this. Was he living out a way of life that he wished he had had as a professional musician? Could be. <clears throat> it's very, very positive because, you know, he never had a childhood and and uh, he made sure that we had a real childhood and, and really had a, a family unit, which, you know, he was in an orphanage for a while. So uh, he made sure that we were had a good family unit and he he told me that when he had three sons, you know, that was a big deal, having three sons. Originally, because he did all kinds of carpentry and odd jobs, he figured he could have his own construction company with three boys, three sons, you could really do well. Um, but he also gave us the music. So, uh, you know, he didn't have money. So basically, he gave us that opportunity. And you got to remember, being a musician back then was not a real job. They, no one thought you could make a living doing that. But he made sure that we had that foundation. Of course, then when we went off on our own, starting playing without the family band, you know, we were making money and gigging. So I think he was kind of pleased about that. And, and I'm sure he would love to have been a professional out on the, in the real world, out in the world. But he had so many bands in the area. He had marching bands, he had concert bands, dance bands, you name it. So he had bands for every occasion. When Mussolini's, when Mussolini's brown shirts came to Mount Morris, he called ahead and found Giovanezza, which is the theme song for Mussolini's youth. 
the youth organization, Joe Venice, the youth. And when the brown shirts were marching down the street of Mount Morris, he had the band start playing that and they were shocked and they gave the old salute to, to Mussolini. They were, saying, they were staying in Dansville at the McFadden mansion. He was a real right winger. I don't know if you remember that. I do. It's the first I've heard about brown shirts anywhere in New York State. Yeah, either, was it the brown shirts or black shirts? I think it was the brown shirts, whatever Mussolini's youth group was. Okay. And okay. this McFadden who had a huge um, uh, resort in Dansville, kind of a, a weird uh, medical kind of uh, uh, colon cleansing and all that. Okay. Uh, he okay. invited them to the United States before, you know, before we got involved in all that. But Pop was always on top of things. He had that theme song. I probably got it out in the garage. But no one even knew what that was. <laughs> what finally, um, everybody got older, and was there a particular thing that caused the family band to, you know, go the way of all bands eventually it has to end somewhere? Well, we were getting more into jazz, and we were in high school. And we didn't have the kind of time when we were in grade school to, to go out and gig all the time. Plus, I think my parents were happy to have some time alone at home and get rid of the kids, get us out the door. What role did uh, your Italian heritage have in this whole thing? I, I noticed that you were written about in a new book about uh, jazz musicians and the Italian heritage. Well, I, I you know, we were we were we were in a town that was mostly Irish American and we were the Sicilians and we were pretty low on the totem pole, but it, it wasn't in your face every day. You know, we, cause our, our group was pretty much uh, among our ethnic uh, neighbors, but, and family, but you know, the, the Italian thing, uh, I never really thought about it until I got into college. I didn't know I was Italian until I got to college and someone called me a name, you know, really, cause we never thought about that. Everybody had a name like ours in our town, except for the others, the other side. And I'm not being, I'm not being, you know, jive about this, but I really didn't think about that race thing until, because we weren't raised as, got to remember, my father came from Sicily, so there was, the, the racism was not there, fundamentally, there was nothing there. But when I got to college, you, well, you meet all kinds of people in college, and, you know, we were talking about Hal, that's where I first met Hal, I think he was the very first Black a uh, friend I've ever had in my life, uh, because in Mount Morris, I think there was one black family. I think, yeah, there was one black family in Mount Morris. Yeah. What would have happened? I, I think Pat said that he gave me a little anecdote that he discovered improvising because uh, he couldn't see the music to play the written out solo. Yeah, at Ted Max Amateur Hour uh, audition. Or, well, there was a contest at one of the, can't remember what it was, but it was in a, in a county fair and they had a, a contest and we entered it. And Pat, I guess the music either blew away, he couldn't see it. And he had that, that was an epiphany because he made it up. And then we realized that that was a thing. But, you know, there was no books. There were no books at, at that period like you can get today. So we would try to copy that. We didn't try. We did. We copied solos off the record. And then we'd take Pop's fake books and see what the chord changes were, which were very poor changes, and try to figure out why did Lee Morgan play that E flat on a C7 chord? Uh, you know, it's like, what is this? You were, you were doing like second year jazz uh, education. I mean, that is such great ear training to discover that on your own. Yeah, it is. Uh, because again, well, I mean, they had these books like hot, hot jazz solos that were written out, you know, make believe solos by somebody and, and Charlie Colin, Charles Colin used to publish those. And those were a rarity. I mean, we get our hands on those. It'd be nice. But they really didn't give you they were pretty diatonic. They didn't give you the real deal. You know, you hear Miles Davis play on some of these tunes, even on a blues. You know, what was that all about? You, you you know, your ears think, wow, it works, but why? Yes. And if That's... I play the same thing, is it going to work as well as that? And we all we all copied solos. Pat still got all the solos in books that he copied. Um, but that's the way you learn. You have to learn by copying. And then hopefully your own thing comes out. Mm -hmm. 
Do you feel like you developed your own thing on the trumpet? No, not really. I think uh, I had up to about some great Lee Morgan licks up until the 60s. But, you know, trumpet was a way of staying in music and making, you know, making some money. But I really didn't have that fire like Pat has or Joe has for the instrument. Because mm-hmm. um, when writing took over, uh, I really didn't, you know, I've got a trumpet back there somewhere, but, you know, it's not my passion. I like playing it. It's fun. But I really didn't have that fire to continue on like Pat did and really get into it. Because, again, the writing took over. So you became a writer. Um, you're dependent on other people to play your music. Yep. How do you, how was, what was your entrance like into that world? Well, um, Buddy Rich, of course, put me on the map. You know, I played trumpet on Buddy's band for about four months. So he, he fired me a couple of times, at least a couple of times. Um, but I learned a lot on that band. Of course, playing in bands, like with my parents, with our family band, you understand how things work. You hear the melody, then you hear the counter line. And when I was playing on uh, uh, in, in college, when I played in big bands in college, I had my own big band in Potsdam. Uh, well, you get to hear all those inner voicings and inner workings. And that's why um, single, single line instrumentalists make the best arrangers. Piano players and guitar players are the hardest people to teach. But a single line instrument, uh, uh, let me put it this way, a non-breathing player, a non-breathing instrument player has the hardest time writing because they don't have to breathe. But a horn player or, or a, a, wood, a, a wind player, put it that way, is, it, are the people who really get it quickly. You know, like Billy Byers and, and uh, Sly Hampton. You, we can go right down the, the Bill Holman, go right down the list. But uh, um, I forgot where we're going with this. <laughs> well, I wondered how you, like if there was a real, a door that opened you for your composing. And I think you said Buddy Rich because you came back and started writing for him. Is that correct? Yes. Um, he, I, I enjoyed the band. You know, he respected me. And if he respected you, he would take a chance on you. If he respected you as a player, he'd take a chance on you as a writer. That's why a lot of the guys in the band were writing charts for the band because he respected their playing and he would listen to what they had to write. Well, uh, I was on the Glenn Miller band for three years, almost three years with Buddy DeFranco. And I learned a lot from him as well. So all the time I was on the Glenn Miller band, I was writing arrangements. I was transcribing the Miller stuff off the 78 recordings because a lot of that music disappeared. The real arrangements disappeared. And so a lot, I mean, we had the library in New York City, which I'd go through all the Bill Finnegan stuff. But a lot of times I was transcribing from a 78 recording on a cassette tape in the back of the bus. But anyway, um, so I, I made all of my mistakes on the Glenn Miller band. And then uh, I, I, we were in England uh, on tour and I said, I can't do this. Cause I looked across the aisle at an alto player named, um, oh God, what? Um, why can't I think of his name? It'll come back to me. Okay. He'd been on the road with every road band there with Al Thompson. He was a second alto player. He played in every band and that's all he did. He was an alcoholic and I looked across and I said, that could be me, you know, at the end of my life, just sitting there in the damn band bus, you know, playing one nighters. So I gave my notice in, in England and I was back in Rochester uh, on unemployment. Uh, a lot of people helped us out, um, like, for instance, Vince Falcone, who was uh, Frank Sinatra's accompanist, he ran a piano company, the Shale Piano Company in Rochester, and he would give us the pianos that people traded in. He gave Chuck Mangione one, he gave Pat one, he gave me one. He'd have the guys deliver it to your apartment. Because, you know, it's not worth anything. It's just like a used car. They'll give you so much for the trade-in. Anyway, um, Long story short, I was on unemployment and I heard that Buddy had signed, Pat, Pat told me that Buddy had signed with RCA Victor. And so I was making 50 bucks a week on unemployment and then doing odd jobs. Uh, a bus tri- trip to Philadelphia was 25 bucks. So I bought a bus ticket to Philadelphia with, with this piece of the road suite that I wrote. 
And um, everybody was there at the club, Brandy's Wharf in Philadelphia, uh, you know, Don Sebesky, all the guys were there with charts. So um, it was a cattle call. So I was there, put on the, 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 the chart down. Uh, I've got a, I've got actually I've got a cassette of the rehearsal and, you know, but he didn't play, he just sat there. And there was a, there was a, it started with a ballad, which is unusual for Jimmy Mosier. And then there was a rock piece uh, and then a solo piano and then this jazz waltz. When we got to the jazz waltz part, after about, I don't know, maybe half the chart, maybe not even half the chart, he said, he stopped it. He says, and he went and sat down on the drums and played it. And at the end, he says, okay, I want you in New York in a couple of weeks. We're going to record your stuff just like that. And, you know, I said, yeah, sure. Right. You know, but that was it. He said, you're in. And, um, you know, I've told this story before, but that really put me on the map, writing for Buddy Rich. I mean, you can't get any bigger than that. Man, I bet you um, made sure that the parts were all correct. I mean, did you do the copying at that by yourself at that time? Yeah, you would think I would do that. You would think I would make all kinds of pain, painful, you know, reviewing. But luckily, a lot of the guys in the band were my friends, and they corrected a lot of mistakes for me. The parts were in pencil. The parts were in pencil. However, when we finally got to um, uh, the RCA Victor recording, this was in the old old days when the record companies paid for the copyist, they paid the composer and uh, the arranger. Everything was union scale, so. I was on the road with uh, a man named Milton Newman, who had worked as a copyist. He taught me how to copy, but then I befriended a, a, a good a good colleague of his, Larry Abel, who became my copyist for years. And he did all the copying and it was all done, you know, the right way. And the record company paid for it. What you do know, you, what uh, do copyists you got residuals. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Wow. What did you expect from him? Did, did you uh, trust him to come to you and say, uh, listen, John, measure, measure 46, you've got this note that I don't think it's what you want. Would he do that? No, he would just say something's wrong there or I don't like that section, cut it out. And you'd have to do it. It's like Mancini said, it's like giving up one of your children, but you have to do it. You can't fall in love with every night note you write because he knows more than you do about what he's presenting. Wow. Yeah, and... He hadn't heard it yet. No. But he could say, he could tell by looking at it. He could tell by hearing it. You know, we would rehearse the whole thing. Okay. He, he can't read me, he couldn't read music, but he had, he had, a, he must have had this second sense of, of the whole picture. For instance, I, you know, my, my CD on the wild side, I recorded Walk on the Wild Side, the whole suite. I wrote that for Buddy and, and he played it, but he never got to record it before he died. And when I brought it into him, there's a, there's a Dixieland section in there that Elmer Bernstein had in the film. He cut the entire thing out and I was pissed, but it works that way. And so when I recorded it myself, I did it the way he wanted it. Because he could tell what the, you know, he could tell, all right, by this point, the audience is getting itchy. They're going to want the drum solo or they're going to want something big. You can't drag it on after a ballad and have a Dixieland thing or whatever, you know, that kind of, that kind of sense. Did you ever write a Buddy Rich chart that didn't have a drum solo that he said, okay, we got to put in a drum solo? Never. And I did a lot of things that weren't drum solos and he liked them. See, one thing about writing for Buddy Rich, I wrote, I wrote for, I write, I've written for the other bands. Buddy did not have a style. People could argue that he did, but he didn't have a style. You could bring any kind of chart into Buddy and he would try it. He may not like it, he may not use it, but he had a voracious appetite for new material. That's uh, my brother Pat hit me to the fact that never bring anything in uh, two weeks or two, or two months or three months before the recording session bring it in at the last minute because he's tired of the other stuff. He wants new stuff. And for subsequent records, I did that. I brought in, you know, he, we were going to record in London two weeks before we were going to London. I brought all that stuff in and say, all right, let's go to London and record it. So that would get played uh, live maybe a few times 
before the yes. session, but not too yes. many times. <laughs> not, not too many times, because again, he, he'd get bored. And although he did have his favorites and he had, he had things he had to play like West Side Story or Channel One Suite, the things the audience expected, like Woody Herman had to play Woodchopper's Ball. You have your little hits and you have to make sure you, you fulfill that requirement for the audience. I wonder if you had a feeling and other composer arrangers have this feeling that I'm writing this chart for Buddy Rich, but I want it to be um, something that other bands will want to play or that I can market to the educational field. And how do I walk that line? I couldn't think that way because the stuff that I write for Buddy Rich was, would be too hard for college bands and high school bands to play. Uh, and there really wasn't a market uh, for real professional charts. So when you talk about Hal Leonard or Kendo or any of the publishing companies, they had a level of, of proficiency that they stuck with for colleges and for high schools, a grade level. Uh, now, some of the things that I ended up publishing were kind of scaled down for that market when I finally did decide to start selling them in, in the you know educational field. Mm -hmm. But I always, when I was writing for the band, I was writing for that band. I wasn't going to shortchange it and try and water it down so it had a second level of you know commerciality. I see. Did you have a way of determining a price for your work, and how did it change over the years? That's a rough one. That is hard because you never know what to charge. You know, the worst thing you can hear a producer say is, thank you for being so reasonable. And that's the last thing you want to hear. Um, you know what? You, you get a sense of what the the band leader or the the client can pay. You get a sense, and you hit them with a figure, and you just hope they they will come back with something, or they don't say get lost. It's hard because you know every market is different. Like for Buddy Rich, a lot of people don't know this, but I rarely got paid by Buddy. A lot of stuff I had to go. I had I had to scream and yell trying to get paid. He didn't have the money. He was used to, as a star, having anything he wanted. He just would spend. I'll, I'll buy this and that. But a lot of times, the manager didn't have the money to pay me. Uh, and uh, when I had friends that were managers, uh, like Stanley K, he would go to bat for me. He'd find the money somewhere. You know, he'd maybe take an extra couple hundred here. But having said that, Buddy gave me all of the publishing rights to everything I had, had done for him. He knew, he knew that was a valuable thing. Woody Herman didn't, Maynard Ferguson didn't, Count Basie didn't. They would grab the publishing as rightfully they should. But he gave me 100% of everything. So that was the payback. It was rough at the time, but you know, uh, the payback is there. Did you ever have a manager or band leader say, oh, come on, John, this, this would be good exposure for you. Yeah, I had that happen. I had a record company out in California, uh, one of Woody's recordings. The guy said, well, we don't pay that kind of money for arrangements. And, oh, you know, this is this is something you should be happy. You're going to get <laughs> you're going to get your <laughs> your stuff on a Woody Herman record or whatever. Yeah, I've got stories, but there's a lot of stories out there. <laughs> you mentioned um, your, your stint with with Glenn Miller. And you, you made your arranging mistakes then. What were the arranging mistakes that you learned about and didn't do later? Uh, writing too much, just writing everything. Um, you know, I, I'll back up and say that when the first symphony orchestra I heard was at Geneseo State Teachers College. My father and mother took us to see an orchestra, the, the, the Rochester Symphony. And I'd never heard anything like that in my life. And I hadn't heard a real full big band at that point either. I, you know, that was the first large ensemble live that I heard. Uh, you know, in high school, we had concert bands and all that. But anyway, when they took a break, I looked at the stage and I could hear all of those instruments just looking at the music stands. Now, it sounds kind of stupid, but uh, when I first went on Buddy's band and I would sit there and uh, in the band itself, 
that didn't happen. But when I stood in front of a band or sat in front of a band and the band took a break, if I looked at the music stands, I could hear all the music. Now I don't need to look at the music stands. I found with the Glenn Miller band that, you know, I can hear the whole package. And, but the problem is, is that you don't have the experience of editing. I think um, maybe Bill Holman said that, you know, you, you write all your life and that toward the end of your career, you learn how to take stuff away, how to not put it down in the first place, how to not to write. So I was writing too busily and too much stuff. And of course, Buddy DeFranco would give me criticisms and comments like that because he, he worked with everybody. And a lot of it took hold. And then by studying the, the Glenn Miller scores, like Bill Finnegan scores and stuff like that, I learned a lot. Um, space is very important. Yes, if you look at a score and everybody's playing all the time, you, you, have, you have trouble. But I know in the past <laughs> I've had instances where I look at a, a score I've written and especially if it's for a large group and gee i haven't written anything for the bassoon in 20 measures i better give him something to do mm -hmm. and, and that is not really the way to think i guess no not at all you have to think in colors and combinations you know with a jazz big band you think you run out of colors but you don't you can always find new combinations uh, you never you could never use up all the devices it's it's interesting you say that because i listened to one of your charts last night of, of your own band and uh, I, I jotted the name down and now I can't find it but it was like a swing chart and you had one trumpet player playing the melody with the sax section and it was such a great effect it was not really totally obvious but it changed the sound of, of the melody that was really cool yeah I stole that from Thad Jones hmm yeah, that that was uh, that would always couple the flugelhorn with the lead alto, and or if the lead uh, melody line in the saxes is a soprano sax, which is a very weak instrument, then he would couple the flugelhorn with the soprano in the melody, and it worked very well. Uh, uh, Bill Stapleton with Woody Herman's band, he did that. He stole that from Thad too. We all we all you know stole from each other, but it's it's interesting that. Uh, um, if you couple things correctly, and it was a compliment you just paid me, that you can't tell what it is that you just you just hear it's in there, you know. Yeah, it's it's, it's a unique sound for that time. You must have transitioned. Well, I should I should say and ask: Do you now use software, Finale or Sibelius, or whatever? Yeah, um, I use Finale only because I can extract the parts. I hate copying parts. Yes. I can write faster with a score pad and, and pencil. I think Gordon Goodwin can as well, and Mark Taylor as well. But uh, after, you got, after you got the sketch done, for me now, once I got it in my head, I just put it down in the computer, and then, uh, then you can extract the parts. Because that's, that's the hardest part, is writing out the parts. That's for sure. But can you tell if using Finale has changed the way you write? No, it hasn't. As a matter of fact, when I was teaching, I just retired a few years ago, I would make it a point to, to all of my students that you cannot use the playback of Finale or Sibelius or any of those. Do not listen to the playback. If you listen to a playback, make everything piano because you're going to get fooled because the, the instrument has no overtones. I put in just as a, an example for the kids, I put in Thad Jones' Quietude. I scored, I put that in Finale. I put in um, Gil Evans' My Ship. I put that in Finale. And I've got the best sound libraries you can buy. All right. And I play it back for the kids. It sounds like crap. You wouldn't dare write that because that doesn't sound right. That's and they hear the sounds, oh, that's not right, so they take it away. They're afraid to put the sharp nine and the natural nine together, you know, in a dominant seven chord because the machine doesn't like it. You know, it sounds awful. So they won't take a chance. And I, that's the one thing I really pounded into their heads, that you cannot do that. And no, it doesn't affect me, but it, it might affect younger writers today. They might, you know, take the easy way, way out because the machine tells them that or the sounds. Plus the opportunities to sit in a big band and absorb all that information over the years is not 
there like it was unless you're in a educational school uh, um, yeah that's right I, I really i really bemoan the fact that there aren't any bands for these kids to go out and get a real training i mean there's nothing like being in a band whether it be a, a small band or a big band but big band learning how to play in a section how to balance you know how to listen it's it's really important as time goes by and you know, terrific arrangers come and go does it become harder to create something new? Well, yes, it does. Be, you know, you could fall into a trap very easily and, and copy your own style. And it is hard to come up with something new. And, you know, you have to constantly listen. Now, there was a period in the 60s and 70s where all these different styles of music were out there and a lot of them, you know, the, the bossa nova, you know, sambas, all these things melded very well with jazz. Well, today we don't have that variety of different cultures coming into jazz. Some people argue with me. Yes, there are some European or world music things that have creeped in, but we don't have, you know, we, we had the straight eighth stuff, we had the samba stuff, we had, uh, you name it, uh, all kinds of different, uh, Styles, styles of music that could be absorbed in jazz, uh, Afro-Cuban, uh, all that stuff. But today, I don't see that wealth of other styles that can be melded into a large ensemble or into jazz. Now, maybe I'm not listening as much as I used to. I probably don't listen as much as I used to. But, you know, I have the XM radio jazz station and I listen to other stations and try to keep, keep current. But it, it's hard to come up with something original when you don't have to put it this way i don't have a deadline i don't have a band leader you know breathing down my neck where's the chart where's the chart so that's an answer okay there's a phrase that i heard from dave ravello who said very good arrangement. said he heard it from maria schneider who heard, who heard it from bob brookmeyer okay <laughs> i'm i'm tracing the lineage and this and the statement was from Brooke Meyer, you should try to hold off as long as you can in an arrangement before you pass it to a soloist. Mm -hmm. So my question is, do you agree with that? And the second follow up is, have you ever felt like you want to give soloists some guidance? for the way they're going to solo on this chart that you've spent many hours working on. Just the opposite. As a matter of fact, I don't agree with Bobby. Uh, Bobby at one point made the statement that a jazz arrangement could be jazz without improvisation. The, 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 the creative art of manipulating the notes in a jazz style was enough without improv improvisation. To me, the chart is just a vehicle. It's just a skeleton to get the improvisation out there. So I, to me, my focus is the, the jazz improvisation. And like, for instance, when I, when I wrote for um, uh, the very first album, I had um, Bud Shank on alto and Clay Jenkins on trumpet, and I did a Horace Silver tune. Now, in some way, I guess I did do what you were asking about, knowing that Bud Shank did not play in that same style as Clay Jenkins. I kept the, the alto solo changes to be very comfortable to the style of bebop and post-bop that Bud Shank could play. And then when I transitioned to the trumpet solo, I went into the Coltrane modal changes that I knew that'd be very comfortable for Clay. I guess in a way I did guide it there, but my real focus is that I'm there for the soloist. That's the whole idea of the chart. And if you listen to all my arrangements, it is about the chart, the, uh, the soloist, especially with my brothers. Yes, yeah, so the one I was listening to last night, um, I think it was Clay playing on it. And yeah, he, he had a lot of space, as, as did the tenor player who, who followed him. Yeah, I, you know, I wrote a chart for Buddy. Uh, we were in Boston at Lenny's on the Turnpike. It was uh, God Bless the Child. And I wrote it for Joe Romano, great alto player. You probably knew Joe, I'm sure. But, um, and so I, I wrote it you know, in a day because you know, he wanted it the next night. And I brought it in 
and I really was pleased with it. And, you know, after, in the second chorus, there was nothing except the rhythm section and Joe, all that nice space, because most soloists don't like backgrounds underneath them. They want that freedom to take it wherever they want to go. And then that night after the game, buddy says, fill that in. I don't like that. It's too much open space. Fill that in. And he made me put backgrounds in. And that's the published arrangement that, that's out there now. But um, he, he, he wanted that. Uh, he wanted it filled in. He liked to have that fullness. I like to hear the space for the soloist. And when they're done, then I'll bring the band back in. When you're in the middle of a chart, are you obsessed with it? Yes. Yes, I am. Matter of fact, I'm totally obsessed with it. And then, you know, your subconscious is always working on it. So when I go to sleep at night, it's still working on that chart. When I get up in the morning, you know, I'll have an answer or I'll have something. I used to do that with TV commercials. I got so, so confident that I knew I had a, a jingle in the morning. And I couldn't get, I couldn't make it, to make it work for me at night. So I would just go to sleep, wake up knowing that I would have the answer in the morning. Now, we, this isn't rocket science and it isn't, uh, you know, uh, some famous symph symphonic work. This is a jingle, but your mind works on that stuff. It totally works on it. And there's always an answer. There's always an answer. I'm glad you moved on to, you brought up jingles because I wanted to spend a little time about, with that. And it seems like another area of music that requires a certain approach uh, especially if it's background music and did you find that difficult to get used to very difficult especially you know uh, 60 second spots you have to say it in 60 seconds but you also have to be able to cut that 60 down to 30 or, or 20 um, or make it longer yeah I, i'll say one thing I'll, i should point out that all the time i was writing jazz with you know Two, two young boys, two children, and a wife. I the, the way you survive is writing whatever it whatever you can, and the jingles and the, the industrial videos and all that stuff saves your life. But and you don't have to put your name on it. So it's it was a, a great way of supporting a family. But a lot of idiots out there. I mean, the the the, the ignorance amongst the advertising agencies is incredible. The plop plop fizz fizz. Uh, the Sammy Davis thing, that was a disaster. I mean, and, you know, you really have to think quickly on your feet. You really have to be sharp and know all the different styles of music when you're writing jingles. You have to know all of the styles. Uh, I did Wegmans commercials for years, all of their commercials. And we had a, a, I wrote the theme and then there was a Thanksgiving, there was an Easter, there was a Oktoberfest and there was a, whatever season they were pushing turkeys or whatever, you know, and, and you have to make it all work. Well, the next time I go into Wegmans, I'm going to say, I know the guy who did all your commercials. Yeah, I did them for years. Yeah, it was a good run. It was a, it was a nice uh, account to have. It really was. You know. So did you have occasion uh, <clears throat> to be in the studio and um, the ad guy who thought he knew music was there and Oh, okay, John, I want this to sound, you know, like the sun is coming up and, and, and these vague um, descriptions and you're trying to find music. Yeah, I mean, anyone who's done jingles has had that experience because they are there to look good to the client. And so they're trying to impress the client with their knowledge because they're charging them all this money. And all the guys in New York knew this. So I would go in and listen to what they had to say. Oh, you want it more blue or you want it more and subtle here and all that. So I'd go out to the guys and I'd say, now, now listen guys, we have to make it a little more. And I would just, you know, look at them and wink. They know I was bullshitting. And they'd play this same exact thing. And he would say, yeah, that's it. Or she would say, yeah, that's it. And the other trick was when they didn't like the mix, the, our, every engineer knows this trick. We'd give the producer a fader, which did nothing. Now, now you say, now listen, I'll be controlling the horns here. When it's when it, when that sound that you don't bring it down just a little bit, and the, it gave gave them something to look to the client. And say, see, I'm important. It never failed. Anybody who's done jingles could give you twenty stories like that. That's great. Do you get um, 
residuals for stuff that gets played again or played during certain events? I used to, yeah. When when uh, when the union was strong in that realm, and when you know synthesizers hadn't taken over yet, yes, we you get you'd get residuals for whatever the run was, and if they reused it, you'd get residuals again. Yeah, and player the players did too. That was a great source of income for players. You yeah, know. they would get a come in and do a sixty second spot and whatever get a union wage for that. Yeah, they do three a day. Steve Gadd was doing, doing double double scale three a day. I mean, I think he had checks at the union he never bothered to pick up. <laughs> have you have you interviewed Steve at all? I've I've tried to get with him, but I maybe I need a phone number from somebody. <laughs> he He's came a along. He came a long way from the uh, Ted Mac Amateur Hour. Uh, yeah, it, well, no, he uh, that was the Mickey Mouse Club when oh, when the he, Mickey Mouse Club. Yeah, we, we were at Sibley's audition, you know, this was for the big Mickey Mouse Club contest. And Steve won because he could dance, dance and play drums. I wonder I'll never forget, I'll never forgive him for that. <laughs> no, my father went up to, uh, I forgot the guy's name. Uh, who was the, the uh, celebrity the yeah. guy that, Dean, not Dean. Anyway, Pop went up to him and said, well, how how come you chose him? He says, well, he could tap dance too. Your kids don't tap dance. They can just play music. Well, I guess you're lucky that your father didn't, you know, call a rehearsal and say, okay, fellas, I got tap shoes for you. Well, he made us go take dance lessons. He did. Oh, yeah, we had to go take tap dance lessons after that. Didn't last very long. I couldn't stand it. So a while back, I watched... Uh, it was a pretty good documentary on Quincy Jones. But I was disappointed that no one asked him, where do your arranging ideas come from? There was mostly just people saying, you know, he how great he was and, you know, his whole resume, which is incredible. But so my question to you is, can you tell me where your arranging ideas how do they occur to you it, the song does it you take the song that you're arranging and that tells you everything it gives you everything you need it really does you know you can change you know you rhythmically or or harmonically you've got all the material to work with and every now well maybe it's just the talent but uh, i'll go through first of all i play through the arrange the uh, the song and listen to it and then something will spring out like, oh, here's a good introduction or here's a good shell chorus or, you know, something in that melody, because that's what you're working with. Something in that melody uh, will uh, will trigger something and then the brain starts taking over. Mancini was that way, too. He said that the melody is a thing. Everything is everything is unimportant, but it's the melody that we have to support. Yeah, he, he was he was a smart guy. If I. Um propose to you, I'm going to commission you, and money is no object, but I want you to do a new take on In the Mood. I probably wouldn't take the job. I might, though. I might, it, depending on the band it was for and, and you know, the musicianship of the band. Um, uh, I would do that. Yeah, I think I could, I could pull that off. Um, you know, it's such a recognizable piece of music that it's hard to touch it. You know what I mean? Um, it'd be like taking uh, Miles Davis, so what, and screwing it up somehow. No, that's a good. That's not a good analogy. But anyway, these are certain sacred things that you you know have a hard time convincing the public they want to hear another version. Put yes. it that way. You know. Actually, I re I recall now that I said that that that, that there was a disco version of it. Uh, could be, could be, yeah. <laughs> I bet it was very successful too. <laughs> I think it was. It was a whole, a whole big band, you know, on on the disco dance floor. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to follow up on something you you just touched on about uh, ownership, and you've done a lot of work in the in the field of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. Does the field and the guidelines and the way things work keep getting more complicated? 
extremely complicated. Yes, with the whole digital rights movement and the the very quick change over to uh, the distribution role or model of, of music now, it is very complicated. Um, there's just been a big uh, reorganization of the mechanical rights organizations, forming a consortium with the government's permission. Things are changing very, very quickly because you no longer have the physical control of the product. Record companies have no control. And individuals have no control. So it's getting more and more difficult to identify what is an infringement. Uh, when it was um, a CD or an LP or a cassette or a video or whatever, there are certain licenses and certain uh, uh, revenue streams that you could follow. Now, I know guys that are getting royalty checks for 10 cents for 2 million plays on Spotify or something like that's an exaggeration. But these, these corporations have taken over and they've belittled the quality and the importance of music to everybody. So now it's the climb back to fight back to say music is important and you should not uh, uh, minimalize its importance. Yeah, there's some, yeah, I think Maria Schneider's last CD was a finger point at all of the uh, digital lords out there. I don't know if you've heard it. It's called the Digital Lords, it's two CDs or something like that. Um, but she's pointing fingers at these large corporations that are, you know, living on the backs of, of creative artists. You said it, it oh, she finger pointed at them. Is that what you said? No, yeah, it's called, um, what's the name of the CD? She's got two, two CDs and um, one is about the, well, I don't want to, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but basically she is condemning the, the digital lords who are out there, like the Spotify's and all that. And I'm sure there's articles, of, I haven't seen any, but I'm sure she's got some articles explaining that. I've got the CD in the other room. I, I played it on my radio show, but um, it's a very intense um, piece of music. The whole package is very intense. Yeah, speaking of when I asked a question about something new, I think she found a way um, to add a, a, a new thing to the big band repertoire, seems like. Yeah, she she was a uh, she studied with Rayburn Wright, who I also studied with. And but I think she really found her her groove when she studied with Bobby Brookmeyer and Gil Evans, when she started uh, listening to them and, and studying with them. That really helped her a lot. And I think it reinforced her her whole body of work. Uh, she probably had that that diatonic sense she has today back then. But I think they really molded it for her. Yeah, she told me this. Um... I won't get off on a tangent here. This only take a second, but it was a very interesting thing when she went to to college and she wrote a piano a piece for two pianos that the professors laughed at it um, quietly because it was in a key. Yeah. And everybody was into atonality at the time and like. Oh, yeah, and still are. <laughs> Well, you remember the old Sid Caesar bit when he was Progress Hornsby and he had the radar antenna on the bell of his tenor, and that's in case he got too close to the melody. Oh, that's good. I'm not. I wasn't aware of that. Oh, Pro Progress Hornsby. You know, as kids, we didn't have any place to go to see jazz, but once in a while there'd be a jazz reference on television, like Sid Caesar doing Progress Hornsby. You know, we were hungry for anything that you know related to jazz. And there was nothing on TV. Then Peter Gunn came out. Boy, that was an explosion right there. Isn't that interesting that um, when you when you compare it nowadays to everything is available at any time, how much joy we took in those discoveries? That's and, right. And and that they came in few and far between, or spending hours listening to the record to the radio, hoping they'll play that song again. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you know, I still hear things. I say, well, what did they do there? I wish, you know, I'll hear it once on the radio and then try and find it so I can figure out what they did. So there's some really good, there's some talented people out there playing and writing. There's no question about it. Uh, speaking of talented people, the, the students that you've had when you were in academia, did you have any advice for them when they were about to graduate to 
help them enter the music world? Not unless they really ask, but the most thing, the, you know, you could tell the sincerity of a, of a student after working with them for a couple of years. And if they had, if they said, I want to write music for a living, then I would give them the advice. You have to go where the food is. You have to go to Los Angeles or go to New York or go to London or Toronto, but you have to go where the writing is important and where there is a, there is a living to be made writing. Now today, yes, you can, you can do everything from a distance, but you're not going to get the work. You have to be out there schmoozing. You have to be visible. And a lot of clients, they don't want to know that you're a hundred miles away. They want to know that they can see you for lunch tomorrow and be there. And you know, those, those kinds of gigs. Uh, but the, I, I tell them you go where the food is and that's where it is. For you, was that mostly New York and Los yeah. Angeles? Mostly New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that was, of course, that was a different period. You know, we got paid to do jingle demos. You got paid for the demo and then they would like it, approve it. And then you, you, you know, get the full, full band, but those were different days, but New York was, was definitely a fertile ground today. The only thing left in New York is Broadway. I shouldn't make such a blanket statement, but as far as the union is concerned, the only, the only thing for musicians today is Broadway. Did you have ever do demos that turned out to be the record? Yeah. And, and a friend of mine, Jay Chataway, he did an, he did a, a orchestra mock-up on synthesizers and they loved it. And they used that instead of the full orchestra. It happens. What were the other things that happened that you sensed as, um, uh oh, this seems like a musical, a big change in the scene. And how am I going to deal with this? Well, that's when I when I left New York State and, and moved down here to teach at the University of Louisville, that everything was going south. I mean, the machines were replacing humans, even the jingles. Um, people were doing them for free just to get the airplay, get the ASCAP airplay. Uh, same out in California. Kids were doing TV themes and still are for nothing just to go get the exposure and get the ASCAP, the world, you know, or BMI, get the airplay performance royalties. Oh. So that's when I knew I knew that, you know, it was time. It was definitely time. And they came after me. So I was, what the heck? Why not? OK. Health insurance. Yes, that's right. With two kids, health insurance. Yes. <laughs> Plus, I enjoy teaching. I really enjoy teaching, and especially at the college level, because you've got a certain uh, caliber of student that, you know, you can you can just jump in here and really bring them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really enjoy the teaching. Jumping back to our how we started, and um, I believe Pat told me that you guys never argued. No, not really, no. If I got all of you on a four person Zoom, could I think of something that might make you argue together? Not really. Okay. We're pretty much on the same page. I think it's, it was our upbringing, that Sicilian upbringing, the family is very close. But of course, we're all in the same business and we all came up together listening to the same stuff. And we have a, a similar political opinions and societal opinions. And we, we, we talk every week, if not more. And, and as I get closer to my next recording, we'll be talking even more than that. So, mm -hmm. but you know, we never argue. We, I mean, we, we would punch each other or hit each other when we were kids, little kids, but, but yeah. Uh, yeah. no, we don't, we don't argue at all. As your careers were, were uh, expanding, did you ever get on the phone with them for advice about a decision you needed to make? Yeah, especially with Pat, because Pat was the one who led us all. Pat, when it was out there first, he was he was the trailblazer. You know, I'm the middle, well-adjusted son, and and uh, but he was the one who took all the blows. He's the one who got me on Buddy Rich's band. You know, he he you know he he would uh, you know I call him for some advice. Yep, he and and he's so knowledgeable. I'll still call him about cer of certain changes. I'll say, you know, what did you know on this tune? What well, actually, I just did that recently because we're doing a, a tune that he did with Elvin Jones. I'm doing it on my next recording. And 
I would call him and say, well, what the hell is this? What is, what is all this stuff? And of course, he's got, it all, he's got it all in his head. He's got all these tunes. And he would give me some ideas because not everything is consistent. Um, in, in, uh, even in modal writing, nothing's that consistent. And there's, there's always something new to bridge, something new to discover. And when I hear something like that, I'll call Pat and say, well, what did he do here? What is that? If I can't figure it out myself. What do your piano parts look like? Well, they're extremely well written because that's the discipline you get for writing for publishing. You know, everything has to be written out. But now what, for my own recordings or for a professional band, I'll only give certain things that I definitely want to have and the rest is them. Because they, I mean, they're going to, anybody can write a better piano part than I can but I can get the basic one down there. So when you're writing for school bands, college and high school, everything has to be written out. The bass line, the piano part. Now they can ignore that if they have the, the chops and the skills, but everything's written out. So my piano parts are very, very well written. Do you like to have keyboard and guitar in your own groups? No, no, they get in the way of each other. Although uh, I will have guitar uh, on two pieces on my new recording as melodic instruments, not as a part of the rhythm section. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 just, I don't know. I mean, Basie and, and Freddie Green is probably about it. I mean, I don't know anybody else that can pull that off. But then they had their roles to play. You know? So because Basie would just tinkle and Freddie would keep it going. When you get ready to do a recording, like you've mentioned, do you always get the people you want? Yes, I try to anyway. Um, you know, I was all set to record last March, just before or April, just before the pandemic. I had it all set up. And, you know, there were certain people that I wanted and I called them and because uh, I had certain people in mind for certain parts. And so, you know, I called well ahead of time. Now they could pull the plug at the last minute if they get a better call, you know, like a film or something. But generally I get the people I want, you know. Will they have seen the music before they get there? Never. No, you know, you take you take players like, well, Pat, Wayne Bergeron, Bill Cunliffe, all those guys, you know, they don't need to see it in front. And when somebody wants the music in front, I get a little suspicious. Oh, that is a quote right there. That, that's, you know, most of us don't live in that world, as, as yeah. the best I, I can say. And, you know, even the best players, they're going to make mistakes and they say, hey, mistake, no big deal. I mean, everybody does. But uh, generally, you know, I like that insecurity of seeing it for the first time and, and having that fire and having that that edge. There's an edge there. Mm -hmm. Clay Jenkins, um, I thought about, you know. It was interesting you mentioned the bassy rhythm section. And um, I wonder if, if you go to a festival with big bands, what is your feeling when you see a microphone in front of every instrument? Hate it. I hate it. You know, you lose that natural balance of the ensemble. I, I can see tweaking the piano just a little bit, maybe, maybe one mic on a piano. But if you're going to play to microphones, you're, you're not going to have a normal balance of a, of a big band. Uh, there's a Larry Wilcox, great arranger in New York. Very few people know who he was, but he was a very good arranger. And he told me something that I'll never forget. He says, when you write for any ensemble, especially orchestra, always write as if you're making a live performance. Then when you get into the studio, the mics are not as important. But if you write for the microphone, you're never going to write a decent chart. And so that's the way you, you have to Right, and that's the way kids should listen when they're in a band. All these microphones, I, I don't get it. Could you explain that a little more? Don't write for the microphone. Yeah, for instance, if you if you're not skilled enough to write for the flute, along with the trumpets and along with the saxophones, if you don't know how to write a natural balance for those instruments, well, then it's not going to work. If you think, oh, I'll put a mic on the flute and then it'll work. That's not that's not good orchestration. 
you can't. You can't think that way. So normally, uh, you would probably use three flutes along with one flute horn and one alto sax or one tenor, more likely, to get the balance you want. So there's a physical, just like rain for strings. Exponentially, they, you, they can go higher and higher the more numbers you have. But if you only have a few strings, you can't go above A above the staff or B above the staff because it thins out. So you have to know those natural balances and then work with them. Once you get into the studio, then the rest is gravy because they can pull all that sound without a lot of this, you know, moving faders and pushing this. And you hear a lot of those kinds of recordings where it's artificially uh, enhanced. Did you learn that from books? No, I learned that from talking with guys like Bill Holman and, and Larry Wilcox and you name it. And then, and Mancini and the, the books, arranging books don't exist. They're, they're, they're orchestration books. They teach you how to voice. Voicing is not arranging. Voicing is just one aspect of arranging. It's just one thing. Uh, people talk about, oh, there's secret voicings. The voicings don't mean crap unless you've got a melody line that, that warrants having, you know, that, or that sound, that voicing. Hmm. So you know, Gil I Evans, think, go, ahead. go ahead. I, I think some of the, there's some unsung orchestrators. Like when I listen to West Side Story and I, and you look like, okay, who orchestrated this? Because it was brilliantly done, at least in my opinion. Um, so I suppose that's a whole other part of the music business, being an orchestrator. It, it really is. There's an, there's an orchestrator named Kim Schomburg who went to Eastman with Maria, I believe. Um, he could tell you some stories. But generally, the, I forgot the orchestrator for major orchestrator for West Side Story. Anyway, those guys were really the backbone because the composer, you know, I, I did some work for uh, Marvin Hamlish and this guy, I mean, he, he had two or three lines that, anyway, um, the orchestrator would take this jumble and make it into something important. I orchestrated on chorus line for, for uh, part of that show and the stuff I was handed was awful, just off, uh, but you make it work, you make it work, you know, uh, that they must have been in a hurry or whatever, or the lack of talent or skill, and you make it full. Boy, the orchestrator, talk to any film composer. If they didn't have a real orchestrator, forget it. You know, I was talking, I'm dropping names. I'm dropping names, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that alone. But a certain uh, major composer did some films in Hollywood, and he was the real composer. And so he went to he went to the producers and they said, oh no, we have orchestrators do all that stuff. Just give me some melodies and go away. And well, anyway, and he told me that story and he, and he was just, he was just aghast. The orchestrators in Hollywood are really the composers, put it that way. Okay. I'm not talking out of school. Everyone knows that. Everyone in the music business knows that. So you based most of your life on the fact that you had this urge, you heard something in your head, you wrote it down, and you waited for someone to play it. Yep. There's nothing Great. here in the chart the first time, is there? It's amazing. Mancini told me that no matter how many times that he's written for orchestra or a big band or films or whatever, he always got nervous when he got on that podium to hear what it really sounded like. He knew what it was going to sound like, but to hear, have that experience, it's great. You say, wow, this is fantastic. And of course, now I have to spend my money to hear it played because there are no big bands to write for anymore. <laughs> right. Get your own band. Yeah, well, that's it. You know, I, that's what prompted me in, in 2004. I did that Walk on the Wild Side, on the Wild Side CD. I figured I wrote for everybody else. Now I'm going to write for me. You know, I'm going to write for me and, and have something out there with my name on it. Finally, I didn't mind being, you know, a second fiddle to the leader of the band, not at all, but there was no place to go with my music. I mean, really, and writing for publishing or for ed the educational field, that's not the same. You know, and you don't really get to hear it played. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just to, uh, to, to wrap up here, I've been going for about an hour. Fascinating 
stuff the the plop plop fizz fizz when i when i saw that in something i read about you i went back and i i looked because i remember that from when i was a kid with mm -hmm. speedy alka seltzer now mm -hmm. that morphed into something else with sammy davis is that correct well, uh, there was a, a man by the name of Tom Dawes who actually wrote the melody. He wrote that theme for the advertising agency. He was in some rock band, I can't remember. But they had so many different versions of that. And they, when Bayer Corporation bought, uh, bought the, uh, uh, Bay, they bought Bayer, Bayer bought uh, Alka-Seltzer, uh, they wanted to reach another market, which would be the African-American market. They didn't have any... Uh, in, they didn't have any exposure in, in that area. So they figured who's the most important TV personality, black TV personality, Sammy Davis. He was on Johnny Carson all the time. So uh, they, they got him to do it. And so we had that particular run of, of Plot Thought, was, which was Sammy Davis Jr. Doing a swing version of it. I did, yeah. Yes. Uh, they wanted a Woody Herman type version, swing version, and they wanted a rock version. And I did both. I did them in New York. I had Ron Carter on bass. I had my brother Joe on drums. I, I think it was Harold Danko on piano because he and Joe had an apartment together. But anyway, it's a full orchestra. It was great. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a we had a Sammy Davis sounded like uh, scratch vocal guy, and. Uh, then, then Sammy was in Las Vegas at Caesars, so uh, I did everything in New York, and we did a scratch vocal. I see. Behind the scenes, fascinating. Did you ever get a call to do a jingle that you just said, I can't do this? Yeah, a couple. I won't elaborate, but there were a couple I just couldn't okay. put my name on. I couldn't put my soul into it, no. Did you but, ever get one that you said, I can't do this, and then your musical mind started working despite yourself? It might have. I really can't remember. It might have, but uh, uh, it's possible. I've had that happen with, with singers when I arrange for singers or not arrange for singers. Uh, and after the fact, I'd say, you know, I could have done this. I could have done that. But really for singers they're, they're a different breed but that's easy work because the melody is covered all you have to do is just support that that singer mm. yeah the easiest the easiest writing you'll ever get in your life is when the producer or the director or whoever says i want a big band chart and i want it in the key of f because the singer sings it that way and i want you to modulate halfway through for a tenor so they tell you exactly what you want you don't have to work it's done but when they say you know, I got a grant one time and I could write anything I want. Total freedom. What do you do? What kind of, you know, no, there was no directive. So that's the hardest. That's really yeah. the hard part. Too many choices. Too many choices. Exactly. <laughs> Give me some restrictions. Give me a stop sign. Give me a caution light. Give me something. <laughs> well, I'll wrap up with the basic non-music question. Um, how are you feeling about the state of our country? Well, it's a little bit better. It's, I mean, I, I see things, you know, in a positive light now. Uh, quite honestly, if we would, and I'll be political, if, if this Trump guy had had another four years, Marie and I would be out of the country. We would be gone. I mean, honestly, uh, I would be probably back in Italy. Uh, I don't know, but that was really strong on my mind because I don't think I could have seen the country deteriorate like that and, and live in it. Okay. Anything that you'd like to uh, add that I haven't asked about? Well, I know that uh, the family history, you know, I, it, it, some of it is in Joe's book. You know, Joe wrote a book on Bill Evans that's coming out in September, uh, his, his time with Bill Evans. Um, and I heard you talk to Pat about education. And if there's an education gene, uh, then we must have it because... Um, our paternal grandfather, <clears throat> excuse me, um, he was able to finish three grades of school before he got indentured to a baron. And it was really rough work. Um, and he died uh, prematurely because of it. Um, 
he was able, he, he would play with the Baron's children after church on Sunday because he wasn't that much older and he taught them how to read. I don't know if he taught them how to write, but he taught them how to read. And the Baron was so knocked out because he was illiterate. Most, most of the, the, of the nobility were illiterate and the, and the church kind of ran their affairs for them that he excused, he excused the indentured loan and gave my grandfather a piece of land to work on shares, to share crop. And then my father became a teacher. We, all three of us became teachers. My two sons are teachers. So there's gotta be some sort of gene there that's, that's you know, passing that on. You have to really like it. You really have to love it. And, and of course, know what you're teaching, know the subject. And that dated back to Sicily, that, that story you started? Yeah, yeah, my, my grandfather, uh, he, he was indentured. Um, and, and again, uh, my father, once he finally got that piece, you couldn't own land in, in, in Sicily or Italy until Mussolini. Nobody could own land except the nobility. So uh, once he was excused, see what happened, you know, uh, children are a commodity. There was no work for people. The children were a commodity. And if you had a lot of children and the baron comes to you saying, I need a worker, I'll give you 50, uh, 500 uh, lira and then you pay me back and you have your kid back. That's the way it worked. And of course, you never could find that 500 lira again if you took it. And so, uh, and my grandfather only had one eye, so he's probably the most compromised of the family. And so he was, and they probably figured this is a way for him to make a living or, you know, have a, a life. Mm -hmm. But my father, my father remembers when he was a little boy working out in the field with, with my grandfather, they would had this piece of land and they would do the wheat. And so, they, you know, but uh, the teaching was always there. I think it dates back at least to my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today and uh, wish you the best of luck with your upcoming recording. Thank you. And, and uh, I look forward to hearing it. I'm looking forward to hearing it too. You know, this, this dry period during the pandemic has made me really antsy and wanting to get things done. Of course, I've had time to look at the parts and correct some mistakes. So there is a, there is some positive thing coming out of this. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot for your time today. Thank you, Monk, for having me. I really enjoyed it. I talk too much. I like it. <laughs>